we wrote code to deliberately create an exception and then we went wrote code to trap for it. So here's our example. Ah, and this is what you meant when you said that the web development example was loaded and not the Java example. Okay. I apologize for that. There's no way for me to recreate that one um, because these computers have deep freeze just like uh, the computers in lab do. So once I leave, it's gone. So I grabbed the wrong example. Okay. So we'll create a new example then. Um, that will involve us not just creating exceptions. Well, we'll create some exceptions and then we will um, we'll process some exceptions and then we'll create some exceptions as well. So let me create a new folder. Java examples for 10.17. Let me create a main class and we're going to create a triangle class. Okay, so public class unit test It's going to have our main, which is public static void. which accepts the string array as arguments. So let me save that in my example folder. Okay. I'm going to create a triangle class, because why not? And what attributes do triangles have? Three sides. We'll make them ints. And we will make a constructor that accepts three arguments.
and populates the sizes. We'll do a set and a get for each. And we'll do a get for each. Lastly, but not least, we'll return a perimeter calculation. Now, the perimeter of a triangle is simply the sum of the three sides. Now notice I'm not making an attribute for perimeter because I can always calculate it. If I have the three sides, I know the perimeter. It's simply the side one plus side two plus side three. Okay? All right. Now, let's go and let's make one of these. And I'm going to make it sort of in a weird way. All right? I'm going to create some integers. Notice what one of the constructors of an integer is. I can give an integer a string and it will convert it to an integer. Now you might wonder why I do that. Why I would do that. Well, let's imagine if the values were coming from a GUI, and we have a text box. A text box, users can type text in, right? So I might have something that's an integer. I hope I would have validation to make sure it was an integer, but I might want to take the value of a text box and convert it into an integer or some other kind of number. So that's why it's kind of cool that we have this. So I have my three integers, i, j, and k, and I'm going to create my new triangle. T equals new triangle. I, J, and K. Can I do that, by the way? This, this triangle is expecting ints, and I'm giving it an integer. Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, because of boxing and unboxing. Anywhere where you can use an int, you can use an integer. So let me go save this as triangle. 
So that might look a little odd to you, but it's acceptable. Well, if I had to put it in an array list for one. Oh. Okay. Uh, again, keep in mind in this example, I'm sort of stacking a deck so that I can test for some errors. Okay, so I might not do things the way I normally do them. But I might also use an integer instead of an int if I was doing exactly this. If I was taking a value that was a string and converting it into an integer. Uh, and again, when might I do that? Well, GUI is a classic example of that because I have a text box on the screen, someone can type text in, I want to type, take that text in and convert it to an integer. There's not a parse method like there is in C-sharp? There is, but there's also, it's also available on the constructor. So I could, I could have called equals integer dot parse int and did that, but this does effectively the same thing. Okay. All right, so I create my triangle and I'm going to print the perimeter of it. And so far, so good. This ought to work because I behaved myself and I passed it real integers. So let's save this. Let me go and compile it. Run it. And then we'll start to break stuff. Hope it compiles. Of course it didn't. I forgot the plus. Notice how one thing forgotten screws up everything, gives me three errors. That's one reason not to be too discouraged when you get a lot of errors, because there might actually not be quite that many things wrong. Okay, I got a clean compile. I can now run it. And it should give me a perimeter of 36, 12 plus 12 plus 12. Now, all that's fine, right? But what if I put some garbage in here? All right? So if I say create an integer from this string and I give it something that really can be converted to an integer, everything works the way I'd expect. But what if I give something that can't be converted to integer? What's going to happen? Compile doesn't notice it, right? Because compile says, hey, that's a legit, that's a, le a legit syntax to create an integer from a string, which we're doing here. That's legit syntax. Here's our classes. I didn't have the right uh, camera on, so it wasn't showing the computer. But when it actually tries to do it, the runtime's going to fail. Remember, your compiles check for syntax. And if something is breaks the rules of the language, it will tell you about it. Or if, for example, an object isn't initialized, it can tell you that too. But your compiler doesn't like actually execute the code and figure it out. All right? Your compiler just makes sure you're more or less following the rules. Now when I go to run this, I get an exception. All right? And the reason is, is that it can't process that string and convert it into an integer. And notice it tells us, going down the line, what went wrong. It was at line six of unit test, which called the constructor on the integer. And that constructor calls the parse in to your question. All right. And then it got an exception. So. What we did last time is we did something like this. 
I can put a try around it. And I can catch the exception, and then I can output something. In this case, for most of the exceptions, I'm simply outputting stuff. You'll see when we're going to use these a lot when we start getting into GUIs, which probably will be next week, where we're going to trap an exception. If it gave us a problem, we're going to just display a message on the screen instead of outputting it. So. So we handled it and said that there's an exception. So instead of the ugly error, we wrote code that can handle it. Now, notice one thing, and we'll leave this this way for now, but we'll go in where we refine this later. We are only catching exception. We're not differentiating between types of exceptions. Any exception that occurs, this code will get hit. All right? Which means that. Let's say the numbers are correct, but somehow we know out that object. Compiler really isn't smart enough to notice that. But at runtime, we'll get a different exception. Notice this relates to two different problems. All right. I'm going to output e to string in both cases. A lot of objects have a two string method, and you're welcome to create two string methods for your own classes that simply display a short description of what the class or what the object is. Like for example, for pizza, your two string method could say small thin crust with pepperoni. All right, so if this error occurs, then it's a language null pointer exception, Java lang null pointer exception. Let me write that down. However, if that's not the problem, if garbage in the data is the problem, we actually get a different kind of exception. And in this case, the exception is going to be number format exception. Sure. Suppose that we have two of the numbers for 12 and one of them are minus 12. And the, that's a, a number, an integer, that it will treat it as that, but logically we would not want a value to be passed in as minus 12 and called them 12. That's correct. The question was, what if one of the numbers was a negative number? Uh, syntactically, that's correct, but semantically or logically that's not correct. We're not at that point yet. Because these are only catching the kinds of exceptions that exist in the framework. And Java has no idea um, what values are legit for this so-called triangle class. We've simply defined them as integers so it will take any integer as of right now. This is more, that's more of a well, it will become an exception issue. Yeah, we can validate in our GUI to make sure that we don't put a negative number in there. But 
we don't want to be at the mercy of everyone that's going to create a GUI that's going to use our classes because someone might not have done, might not be a good programmer, might not do validation. So we want to build our classes to be foolproof. So what we will do is we'll create our own exceptions that correspond to these things. If you validate, great. If you don't validate, this will kind of be like sort of the uh, gatekeeper that says, okay, you still, even though you should have validated, you still are trying to give me a bad value, I'm going to keep that from happening. Okay. All right? As far as this goes, though, I can trap for different kinds of exceptions. And I can do it like this. And I need to just review the syntax for a second. All right, so I can have multiple catch blocks and say what to do. If I catch a null pointer exception, then I can have code specifically written to handle This is a little tough to de uh, demonstrate because all we're doing is we're outputting messages. But if we get this kind of exception, we're going to catch it and we're going uh, to do some code specifically written for null pointer exceptions. If, however, we get the number format exception, we can have code specifically written for number format. If it makes it through here, it's some other kind of exception other than those other two. So this is an unknown exception. Well, that's not true. This isn't one of the two exceptions I expect. It's probably a better way to put it. Whoever just yawned, I feel you. That's okay. That's okay. All right. So now, the error that we have in here is the number format one. Therefore, we didn't get that kind of exception, so it passed over this one. This is the exception we got, so it caught that exception. This was, in, 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 in the, the correct terminology, this was the exception that was thrown. Therefore, this catches it, and we can have code specifically written for that kind of exception. If, however, we had the other kind of exception, then we
we can have code specifically written for null pointer exception. So we can very much fine tune what we do in the case of each exception. Again, for most classroom exercises, we're pretty much just outputting a message. All right? But thinking a little ahead a little bit, um, there very well could be different things that you do based on the kind of exception that you get all right, in a lar larger, more realistic application. There might be different things that you do if one thing happens versus another thing happens. Questions about this? Not sure I'm following your answer. Your question. Yeah. The code that gets called here will get called if it was a null pointer exception. So if we made it to this line of code, we know we have a null pointer exception. We can also say, we can also output the two string method. Maybe that would be a better thing to do as well. Because we know that exception has a two string method. So we can get details about the exception. Remember that exception object is sort of like the, the accident report that the police files for the problem. But again, it goes beyond simply knowing the exception. Depending on the particular problem, we can write code that will do its thing and um, you know, alert the user that this is a problem. Or if it's a different kind of process, if it's a batch process, we write to a log or whatever. So a lot of what we do when there's an exception is going to depend on the context of the program that we're writing. But what I'm trying to show you is we can determine and we can have code specific for the problem and to deal with that issue in a very specific way as opposed to just having like we had in the example on Monday where if there was an exception, it simply just said, hey, there's an exception. Here we can have code specific to the kind of exception that you have. All right. Now, Again, these are the things that just violate the rules of the objects in the framework. But our classes sort of have logical rules associated with them, too. For example, a couple things. Our sides can't be less than 0. Um, that camera doesn't appear to be working. so. Let me write over here. Side one, two, and three are all greater than zero. There's another rule about triangles. All right? Yes? No. That would be a rule for right triangles. Yeah, in fact, depending on the time I was going to talk about, we could put in a right triangle class. All right? Um, and if we, if we still have time, or maybe Monday, we'll, we'll talk about a right triangle class. But let's, um, but there is, there is a rule relating to the sides. Is this a valid triangle? One, one, and eight are the three sides. Is that a valid triangle? Uh, right. Uh, actually, it's not. It's not a valid triangle. Because if you can imagine, and I'll have to try to hold up the, the sign. Well, you can't really see me. I'll try holding it up anyhow. If we had an eight 
foot side, a one foot and a one foot, it would look kind of like this. There's no way we could make these go where they would connect at a, at a, at a vertex. So the rule for that is that C, any side, has to be less than the sum of the other two sides. All right? So does that apply here? 1, 8, and 1. So let's say 1 is A, 8 is B, 2 is C. So A has to be less than B plus C. So is A less than B plus C? Yes, because 1 is less than 8 plus 1. Is B less than A plus C? B is 8, A and C are 2. Nope, so it's not valid. All right. Another, another corollary of this is that the shortest distance between two points is always a straight line. So if the side is a straight line and you have two sides which add up to less than that, then that path would actually be less than the straight line, which doesn't logically make sense. So we have two rules uh, that we're going to enforce about our triangles. Number one is that they all need to be a positive number. And number two, that the sum of each pair has to be greater than the sum of the third side. Than, than the third side, not the sum of the third side, than the third side. OK, so let's put that code in. Now, let's do the easier one first. The three sides have to be uh, greater than 0. We have two places where the, si the sides could be set, right? They could be set through the constructor, or they could be set through the set side methods. I'm going to do this. My constructor is going to call the set side method. All right? Why? Because I only have to put that validation in one place then. All right? So I'm going to say this dot set side one arg1. This set side 2 and side 3. Okay? So you're calling the uh, set. I'm calling the set method. In, instead of putting validation here and validation here. All right, I'm just passing it along. All right, because I am sleepy. <laughs> Set side three. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say here, if arg is less than one, because they're integers, right? And we, we, we also can't have a zero side for a triangle, right? So if arg is less than one, then I'm going to throw an exception. Okay. Okay, that's what I got. Let's compile this and see if it's going to work. Hint, it's not. All right. It's telling me that there's a problem. If you throw an exception, Someone has to catch it. 
all right? Which means that I could have code in here that caught it. So this could be in a try-catch block if I wanted to. Or I could throw the exception and let someone else handle it, all right? I'm usually going to let my user interface handle what to do with the exceptions. I don't want this class making decisions of what to do with the exceptions. So I have to either have code here handle it, or I have to throw it to someone else to handle. So I'm going to say that this throws an exception. All right. So now, this throws an exception, and if it gets an exception, it's simply going to throw it to whoever called it. Now, we haven't, we're probably going to get another error in a minute here. All right. Our constructor calls this. This could throw an exception. Therefore, our constructor either has to handle the exception or throw it to whoever called it. It's sort of like the buck stops here, right? There has to be someone that's going to handle this exception. And if whoever throws the exception or whoever calls what throws the exception isn't going to handle it, then it has to throw it back to the, to the last guy on the list, all right? So Think of the, the procedure of this code. I call the, uh, the, the, the sequence of this code. I call and try to give, I'm going to get rid of this stuff now. Uh, no, I'll keep it here. I'm going to give this guy a value of negative 1, OK? So line 12 calls this and tries to create a triangle with side 1 of negative 1. Well, the constructor calls set side one. It throws an exception. That means the constructor either has to catch it or throw it. It's not going to catch it. It's going to throw it, which means that there has to be code here to handle it. And sure enough, there is code to catch that exception. So I'm simply going to say my constructor also throws an exception. And now it should compile completely. And we can run it. Ah. Got to save this guy. We get a Java Lang exception, side one is invalid. And this is not one of the two exceptions I expect. So in other words, I threw an exception. It wasn't a null pointer exception. It wasn't a number format exception. It was still an exception, so this guy caught it. And it told me that it was an exception and displayed to string and this is not one of the two exceptions that I expected. Okay. I'm going to do this for the other three sides, other two sides. Go ahead. All right, I'm going to do this for the other two sides. Except I'm going to change that to two into three. Oh, really not. 
mess something up. Oh, a semicolon expected illegal start at line 33. Oh. One misplaced curly bracket gave me 12 errors. and tells me that one's invalid. I can scooch around and change the order of these things. And so on. All right, and tells me side three is in air. Okay, so I can then go in and I can put my other rule in to throw an exception, all right? And I could say if. Side one is greater than side two plus side three, or which is represented by the two vertical lines, sometimes called the pipe. or side two is greater than side one plus side three, or side three is greater than side two plus side one, then I can throw a new exception that says Each side must be less than some of other sides. All right, let's try to compile that. Let's go in here and let's make a, a triangle that is not legal. A one a one and an eight. That's not a legal triangle, right? Because eight is not less than the sum of the other two sides. And I get that exception. Now, there's two kinds of exceptions checked and unchecked exceptions Java exceptions underneath air and runtime classes are unchecked everything else under throwable is checked what does that mean a checked exception means that you expected it and I either am going to catch it or throw it. An unchecked exception 
is one where we don't have to catch it or throw it. So if I made this, instead of exception, if I threw a runtime exception, runtime exception are unchecked, but everything underneath exception is checked. By checked, I mean giving a compiler error if it's thrown and not caught. So if I change these to runtime exceptions, I don't have to say that it's thrown. If I have it as exceptions, then it has to be caught. Yeah, if I were to make these, if I were to make these run time exceptions. I wouldn't have to throw it. and it won't give me a compile error. It'll catch it, of course, but it won't, it, the compiler won't demand that whoever throws it catches it or throws it. So the, the impact is if I make this an exception, I have to acknowledge that I need to either handle it by throwing it or catching it. If I make it a runtime exception, then I don't have to say that I'm going to throw it. It would depend on the application and what you're doing. Generally speaking, if there's something you can do about it, you'll make it. There's something that you want to force happen, and that you can do about it, you can do something about it, and there's a chance to recover from it, you'd make it uh, a checked exception. Because I won't even get an error if I don't have a try-catch block there, but the program will just blow up. Generally speaking, you want to do something other than just letting it blow up. Now what I have isn't bad, but again, it's possible that I might want to do some very specific code depending on the kind of triangle error I get, right? Maybe not. Maybe I'm going to hand all triangle errors the same way. But maybe I'm going to do something different if it's one kind of triangle error but, or versus the other kind of triangle error. If I am just throwing exceptions, it's not easy for me to do that because they'll get lumped in with all the other generic exceptions that I might get. So what I want to do is I want to actually create a specific exception class for each of these exceptions, all right? And then I can write code specifically to catch and handle that a certain way, all right? That's what we'll do on Monday. We'll go in and before we start the GUIs, we'll go in and we will um, create our own specific exception so that we can handle it a certain way as opposed to just creating a generic 
exception and handling it the way that we would handle any of the other generic exceptions. Well, when is it due? Wednesday. I think by, I think by Wednesday we'll, we'll cover how to create a specific exception for it. If you do it one way to, to go in and make the change, it'll just be like a couple lines of code. So it's not like you have to rewrite the whole thing. Right. Exactly. 